this is Jared, and today we're going through another daily devotional. This time, we're walking through one of the Psalms, and we're taking a look at context, context, context! Let's get to it. All right, this one's a winner. We're geared up, ready to go. Okay, welcome back to another Tuesday Daily Devotional. Uh, this channel is called In Him. It's a play on words if you haven't figured that out already. And on Tuesdays we do devotionals. On other days, uh, not recently, but usually we do other videos devoted to music, worship, uh, ministry, and other Christian-related topics. And today we walk through uh, one of the Psalms. This Today we're, we're, we're looking at uh, Psalm 84. It's a really popular psalm, uh, and I, I really was interested in walking through this one on my own. There's so much packed into this one, and I've read it before in the past. I've read it in the context of music. It's set several times, uh, most notably by people like uh, Schütz and uh, Johannes Brahms in his uh, German Requiem, Ein Deutsches Requiem. He has a, a setting of this, the 84th Psalm, and it starts... Uh, this way, I'm sure as soon as you hear it, you'll, you'll know. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord, and my heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. That's how the 84th Psalm starts. It's got a lot of history, it's got a lot of content in here, and we're going to be primarily focusing on the last half. It's kind of divided into thirds, this 84th Psalm, and we're going to be uh, focused really on the last third. Uh, I said the last half, but really the last third of this Psalm. And we're, But before we get into the actual thing that we're going to be looking at and uh, I'm going to be reading today, I'm actually going to be starting in uh, verse 10, uh, which is also a very popular uh, 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 you know, part of the psalm, uh, particularly the, this psalm. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about context. It's so important when we are talking about, especially Old Testament writings, uh, to talk about the context in which they were written so that we can better understand why they were written, how they were written, what they meant when they said certain things and what it was for, who it was for, because all of those things kind of uh, uh, should, should at least shape what you think about the text. It should shape uh, what, what you take away from the text. Who is it written for? Is it written for us today? Is it written for a people at a certain time in history? Is it written to tell us something about the nature of God? Is it written, written to tell us something about the nature of humanity? Is it written as as uh, a? Is it written as poetry? Is it written as history? All of these things uh, really allow us uh, to to read this living word, what we talked about last week, this living word, or was it two weeks ago, the living word, and really diving into uh, and, and learning all that we can from what God has, has preserved all these years. In the context of this 84th Psalm, if you read it with me, um, at the beginning, the superscript, it says, to the choir master, according to the uh, Gittith? Gittith? I think that's right. I looked it up. I don't know what it is. I think it's a musical term, uh, probably. It might be similar to, to Toctus, the Toct, uh, what we would consult, call the beat, what we used to call the beat. Um, and so it's probably a musical term of some kind. They would know what they were talking about back then. But it, uh, right next to that it says, A Psalm of the Sons of Korah. Now if you'll remember back to your Old Testament uh, readings, uh, in uh, Exodus, if you if you remember in um, uh, in Corinthian, uh, not Corinthians. Oh, that's silly. Oh my! Now now I'm really getting ahead of myself. I gotta look it up. Oh, Chronicles, not Corinthians. Chronicles. My bad. If you remember uh, the the readings out of Exodus and Chronicles, you'll you'll remember the story of 
Moses and the story of how the tribes were divided. You'll remember how they set up the government. And you'll remember, if you remember Korah, Korah was the cousin of Moses. And uh, I think Korah actually led a revolt against Moses, against the head of the, of the people at the time that God ordained to lead the people. And so what happens is Korah leads the revolt, either led or was one of the leaders. I can't quite recall, but then God is displeased. Moses is displeased. Everyone's kind of upset. It completely fails and God uh, annihilates 250 of them, something like that. Everyone who conspired against Moses. And uh, just like other uh, hyperbolic language in the Old Testament, uh, God annihilated, completely eviscerated the people who rose up against Moses, right? But that, but he, he just like other passages that say things like that, it didn't mean he killed everyone because now we see in this 84th Psalm that the sons of Korah, the descendants of Korah, didn't die by the hands of God, just the people who were responsible directly with conspiring against the leadership of of God that he ordained to, to lead the people, right? And so, obviously that was hyperbolic language uh, there because he spared the sons of Korah, obviously, if Korah continued to have descendants. A couple of other things about the the house of Korah, let's call it. I think they have another, another uh, name for that kind of division of leadership in, uh, you know, of, of the tribes. Um, I think they were divided into, uh, for my studies in, in, my, in my recent memory, they were divided into three types of jobs that the, that the descendants of Korah would take on. One of them was as, uh, as, as singers. So they were prevalent singers, kind of an auxiliary to the Levites, right? They were responsible for music and song. The second job that they kind of took on was pottery. They were potters. They were responsible for preparing preparing the dishes that brought the the meats and the and the animals to be sacrificed by the levites then thirdly uh, they were the doorkeepers of the place where god resided now that's important because here in this chapter uh, it makes a lot of sense what they say here in psalm 84. It makes sense that they were these things, specifically the door keepers, because here we read in uh, uh, Psalm 84, uh, starting in verse 10. Let's read it together. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. So, <laughs> here in this 84th, uh, uh, what's the word, a chapter of Psalms? I don't know why I had such trouble with that word, but it is a chapter of the book of Psalms. You'll recall... The book of Psalms is divided uh, historically up into five parts, kind of mirroring the, the five-fold uh, nature of the Torah. Um, and so this, this pentagonal uh, idea of, of Scripture. And so the Psalms, one of the most important uh, books of this, of this document, of, of the Old Testament certainly, but of the entire Old and New Testament combined Bible, Holy Bible, uh, that it's it's so interesting the symbolism of dividing it into five parts and this 84th um, uh, chapter of the book of Psalms actually starts the third section of the book the division the third section it's it right smack dab in the middle of everything this 84th chapter of Psalms. Now you see, like we said earlier, it is by uh, attributed to the sons of Korah, uh, who were both involved in music making, but some of them were involved also in door keeping. Now they say uh, here, right where we started in verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I bet you'll remember that being quoted 
by a, a pretty popular uh, uh, Christian music tune out of the early 2000s or late 90s, the better is one day in your courts, right? You remember that? And then it goes on, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, this is what I wanted to focus on today because I just recently watched a clip from the new movie that just came out. It's called Alita Battle Angel. Have you heard of this this thing? It's about some kind of robot butt-kicking chick who um, who lives in a, in a post-apocalyptic future and uh, the, all of the technology has advanced so far where the robots and there are cyborgs and there are androids. There are automatons of technolo technological uh, nature that have sentience, that have uh, will, they have emotion, they look and act like humans to the, to the extent that they um, are among the people and they do human jobs and uh, I'm sure there's some parallels there to our current day situation where uh, technology is ever advancing and, and always uh, learning and we're right on the cusp of some of these questions of morality as it relates to technology. But this movie, Alita Battle Angel, is uh, really struck me. The clip that I watched, it had the antagonist, the bad guy, the villain of the story, um, who said something to the to the extent of or 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 uh, within this is paraphrasing, but he said something like, "I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven." Now I'll say that again: I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. That is what this man said. This this uh, villain had had said. Uh, to presumably to the to the protagonist, the good guy, this this Alita, you know, feminist, you know, vision idealistic, you know, creature who was was both uh, uh, extremely sm small in stature, but also was was uh, able to fight just like uh, a battle angel should, just like the namesake would imply, but. The real nature is that I don't think, just like in movies today, it seems like the lines between protagonist and antagonist, the, the lines between good guy and bad guy, are so often blurred. It's almost like you don't know really which side one person is on. You don't know who to root for. And I imagine there's a sentiment in what the villain said that the hero would agree with. This idea that it's better to be the top dog even though you might be perceived as bad than to be someone who would serve in a place that would be seen as good. It's better to be the top dog um, and to be on top, even if it's a bad situation uh, and you are vilified, than to be uh, to to be in a lessened state stature, to be um, to be made low or be humbled, even if it's in a place of glory of goodness. And there's something about that that I think. And I, like I said, I haven't seen the movie, but I have this sense that there's probably something about the way that filmmaking and characterization happens today that it's probably a sentiment that most of the characters agree with, that it's, it's okay to do bad things as long as you end up on top. It's okay to be the bad guy because the good guys are just like us. There's a trend in today's cinema where there are things called anti-heroes. They are the hero of the story, but they're not good. They have no innate good within them, but their results are good. And so that somehow makes them holy. It somehow makes them righteous. It somehow makes them just as if justice is on their side, even though they are vigilantes. You think of Batman, you think of people like Deadpool. We watched uh, several months ago, or several, maybe it was a year at this point, uh, the movie Suicide Squad, which completely honors destruction and evil. It, 
it elevates the villainhood status and makes you see that maybe we're not on different sides. The villains want exactly what the good guys want, and in reality, the good guys are actually um, making servants, slaves out of the bad guys. They're doing, the bad guys are doing the good guys' bidding, uh, and it's in such a demeaning way that it makes the bad guys look like good guys. So what's going on here? Is it really better to be a ruler in hell than a servant in heaven? And this passage in Psalm 84 completely rejects that. It says right there, um, uh, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. It's better to be the guy who opens the door uh, than uh, in the place of glory, in the place of goodness, in the place of honor where God resides, than to be the honored guest, to be the one sitting in comfort and luxury in the tents of wickedness. Now, this is an idea that our culture completely rejects. I think uh, that is completely clear in that quote that I gave you from this new movie that's out. And um, I think that's a sentiment that a lot of people would agree with. It's better, I can't be a, a servant. I can't lower myself. I can't humble myself. That would be beneath me, even if it means that I'm dwelling among a people of unclean lips, even though I dwell among a people who act in wickedness, who do not repent of their ways and they they live in sin and they don't care that they're living in sin. And there's something that is countercultural about this God's word that tries to keep us away. I reject that notion. It is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I do believe that. I think there is some truth to be derived here that the sons of Korah have have given us through this 84th chapter of Psalms. For a day in your courts is better than a house thousand elsewhere. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. I'm reminded of Jesus um, and his sacrifice as, of course, we are in the, the season of Lent right now. So it's hard not to compare everything to the season that we're in in the church calendar and we're preparing for Easter, but we're in this time of Lent where we give up, we give of ourselves, we choose willingly, freely to release what we have, our luxuries, our worldly desires, Maybe you gave up caffeine, maybe you gave up sweets, maybe you gave up social media as a really popular thing this year. I think of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, but also his sacrifice in station. You remember the scene where he goes before his disciples and he notices in the house that he's in, it's a it's a well-to-do house, but no servants had come and washed the disciples' feet, Jesus' feet. And so he takes it upon himself. He grabs a washcloth and a basin of water, and he walks around the table, and he does the work of the servant. What does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to dwell in righteousness? What does it mean to be a doorkeeper, to be someone of a lowly station in the house of God? What does it mean to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Today, I hope you reject that same notion, that notion that it's better to be the top dog in hell than to be a servant in heaven, because that's simply 
not true. I hope that you hold fast to this scripture, the 84th chapter of Psalms, which was written by people of lowly station, but who were absolutely convicted that their job was of absolute necessity, even though it was an unappreciated job, that they took it with honor because they were doing it for the Lord. So go with this benediction. Go with the power of God in your lives that you can be a servant. And remember that Jesus has said these words to you, to the disciples, to the church as a whole, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That in your servanthood, you will be exalted that your treasures are not stored up here on earth, but that you're seeking to store up treasures in heaven. Go in peace.